Let's open up in a word of prayer. It's good to have you with us this morning. We are uh, in an amazing section of Scripture in Revelation chapter 20. And um, uh, as we've been looking at the book of Revelation, we're starting to wind things down, but we've seen, you know, Jesus revealing himself to uh, the Apostle John there on the island of Patmos back in chapter 1. He gave him the outline for the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 19, where he says, Write the things which you have seen. And what did he just see? Well, the risen, glorified Jesus appeared to him, and he gives a description of himself to him. Then he says, write the things which are, and then we're told the things which are, are the seven churches, which are chapters 2 and 3. And then after the churches are done, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, uh, Jesus told him, write the things which should come after these things. And so chapter 4, 1 says, after these things, after the church is done, John is caught up into heaven. I believe that's where the rapture takes place in the book of Revelation. And from chapter 4 through 19, the whole perspective is from heaven, uh, looking down during the great tribulation that begins in chapter 6. And from chapter 6 through 19, uh, there's death, destruction, God's wrath is being poured out, Satan is let loose, uh, not let loose, but Satan has so many demons and uh, Armageddon is taking place. There's just so much happening. It's destroying planet Earth. It's on the brink of total destruction. And then in chapter 19, we saw in verse 11 that Jesus mounts up on his white horse and we, the bride of Christ, will come back with him, with the mighty angels of God. And he comes back to Earth and he will begin to establish his kingdom upon the earth. Now we saw last week that when he returns, one of the first things that happens is the Antichrist and his right-hand man, the false prophet, are thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever, and that's the first two that end up in the lake of fire. We're told that Satan, by uh, this angel, we'll just call him Ralph, I don't know, we don't know who he is, but this angel binds him with a great chain and throws him into the bottomless pit, and he's there for 1,000 years. So he's locked away during what we call the millennial reign of Christ. That's a 1,000 years where Jesus will be ruling and reigning. This is when the kingdom of God is established on earth for a 1,000 years. That's when it takes place. That's when it happens uh, during that time. Satan will be decommissioned, and so the, the kingdom of God will truly be a place, as we looked at verses last week in Isaiah 11, 35, 65, 66, where the, uh, we're told that you know it's going to bloom like the, a garden. It'll be like the Garden of Eden. The animal kingdom will get along. It's just going to be peace and joy righteousness upon the earth. Jesus himself is going to rule and reign, and, and that's the biggest reason why the thousand-year reign of Christ is going to be so glorious, because he himself uh, is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And we'll be in our resurrection bodies ruling and reigning with him, we're told. And so as the King of kings, as the Lord of lords, his rule, his reign is without question. His rule will be perfect. Uh, what Jesus says goes, and all of God's saints are going to be ruling and reigning with him. So it's going to be an, an amazing time. So let's open up in a word of prayer, and we will uh, dive in and see what happens at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we just thank you for your word. It's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And we do pray that you'd pierce our hearts and our minds with your truth, with your peace, with understanding. Lord, that we would have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us. Uh, apart from your Holy Spirit, we cannot understand your word. And so we pray your Holy Spirit would quicken our hearts uh, to receive what you have for each one of us. And Lord, we thank you for the days in which we are living. We know the time is short. We know the rapture can take place at any moment. In the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. And so we look forward to that day when we see you face to face. But in the meantime, Lord, until you come for your bride, we pray that we would be vessels of honor for your glory, that we would be shining the light, we'd be salt in this world around us, uh, proclaiming the good news of Jesus to those who are lost, who are dying in their sins, because apart from you, there is no salvation. Apart from you, the only thing that is destined for those who reject the gospel is 
eternity separated from you. And Lord, that grieves our hearts as we think of these things, but at the same time, you've given us a mission which is to proclaim the good news of Jesus to a lost and dying world. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bless this time together in your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All those who survive uh, the great tribulation and turn to Christ at his second coming, they will enter into the millennium, as we talked about, in their natural bodies. And they will begin to repopulate the earth during that thousand-year time. And at the same time, Jesus is going to remove the curse that has been brought upon this world since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. When they sinned, that's when death came in, you know, on the scene. That's why we believe in a young earth, because nothing died until Adam and Eve sinned, and that sin is what causes death. And so that's why I personally believe in a young earth, because it's not billions of years before man showed up and billions of years of animals and dinosaurs and amoebas dying off. They all died off after the sin came in the world when Adam and Eve disobeyed God's word. Sin is what brings death. So when Jesus returns, he removes the curse. And when that curse that's upon this planet is removed, uh, God's original design for this world will be kicked in once again. And, and the Apostle Paul gives us an insight into this in uh, Romans chapter 8. Uh, starting in verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So he's talking about you know being in these bodies, we suffer, and it's difficult, but the time is coming when uh, we're going to be changed. But he says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's when we receive our resurrection bodies. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And so again, once Jesus sets up the kingdom of God on earth, the groaning that this planet has been experiencing and will really experience during the Great Tribulation, when we see these massive earthquakes we've talked about that rocks the whole world and, and devastates planet earth, and then all the judgments, all the oceans are destroyed. We've seen all these things. It's going to be on the brink of annihilation, but then Jesus is going to remove that curse and the weight of sin that is, you know, on this planet, and all that will cease, and all the human beings and all the animals and birds, all the plant life will flourish once again like it was in the Garden of Eden. So that's going to take place for a thousand years. Now, another reason why the millennium is going to be so amazing is because we'll get to watch the Lord fulfill his promise that he made to the Jewish people over 3,000 years ago. And that promise was that David would rule and reign upon his throne forever. And that will be fulfilled through Jesus, but David is also going to be raised up as well. And, and God promised David and his son Solomon much bigger territories than they've ever had, uh, that Israel's ever had. And during the millennial reign of Christ, it'll be much larger than they've ever seen. But then... There is one major thing that the millennium reign of Christ uh, cannot accomplish. There's one major thing that the, uh, the thousand-year reign of Christ and being in a perfect environment on earth for a thousand years, one thing that it cannot accomplish is to change a sinner's heart. Remember, there's going to be many people that survive the Great Tribulation. They go into the millennial reign in their natural bodies. They'll be repopulating the earth. But their heart has to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because we're going to see here in a moment, many people don't receive the Lord. Many people, even during this perfect time, are going to rebel against the Lord. And again, there's only one means of salvation, that's faith alone in Christ alone, because the Bible is very clear, only Jesus can heal and save, only Jesus in his blood can wash away a person's sin, 
Only Jesus can heal a broken heart. Only he can remove the sin from a person's heart and replace it with joy, the joy of God's salvation. Because again, as we'll see in a moment, multitudes of people who are alive during the millennial reign of Christ at the end of the millennium will rebel against God. It's hard for me to imagine. You know, we talk about... Um, environmentalism, and a lot of people think, well, if people just had the right environment, environmental determinism, if we have the perfect environment, then people will flourish. If people are born in a good place, they'll flourish. If people are born on the wrong side of the track, so to speak, oh, they're destined to fail. That's not true. There's a lot of people who have been born with lots and lots of money that commit suicide, they're born with all that you can imagine and all you could have in this world, but they reject the Lord. They die miserable. It's not who you, or where you're born. It's who you put your faith and trust in. Jesus Christ, he alone can change a heart. And so we're going to see you know, that even living in a perfect environment, again, like the Garden of Eden, they still rebel. Well, what did Adam and Eve do? They rebelled and they were in the perfect environment. No sin anywhere. God said, of all these trees, you can freely eat, except for that one tree. The day you eat of it, you'll surely die. And they chose wrong. You know, this will just prove what Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10 make very clear. And this will happen one last time at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And so again, even after a thousand years of paradise on earth, many people will rebel against Jesus because he's ruling and reigning. Now, shouldn't come as any surprise. Jesus was perfect in all of his ways when he was here 2,000 years ago. And yet they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. They were wicked, uh, they rejected, they treated Jesus horribly, and so we'll see the same thing in a much larger scale at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. So we're going to pick up in chapter 20, verse 7. It says, Now when the thousand years have expired. So very quickly, it just cuts right through to the end. You know, Jesus comes back, he establishes his kingdom, he's ruling and reigning. There's lots and lots of verses in the Old Testament to describe in detail what he does, how he ministers. People are going to be flocking to Jerusalem to hear him, the Messiah. And so it just quickly goes to the end. When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Again, he's been in the bottomless pit for a thousand years and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Uh, now, the, again, this is really astonishing to me that after a thousand years of peace and prosperity and the gardens you know, will flourish, the deserts are going to bloom, it's going to be beautiful throughout this world, pristine, and now Satan's let loose, and yet, even though Jesus has been ruling and reigning in perfect righteousness, Satan is released, and what does he do? He quickly deceives the nations of the world into believing that I can do better than Jesus. I can rule better than him, and people are going to like, oh, wow, okay, and multitude, millions of people are going to follow him in this rebellion. Now remember, it was at the end of verse 3, if you want to look back at verse 3 of this chapter, we're told that Satan must be released for, what did it say, a little while. Micros chronos is the Greek for little while. So he's released for a very, very short time. I had somebody tell me years ago, oh, when he's released, it's going to take you know hundreds and hundreds of years for him to get all these people worked up against Jesus. No, it's going to be micros chronos, a very short time. He just very quickly gets his army to follow him, and he gathers this army. It's huge. It says, as the sand of the sea. In other words, millions upon millions of people will join him in this final rebellion to overthrow Jesus. Now, 
again, there's a lot of information in these two verses here. For example, 1,000 years in prison did not change Satan's heart. Not that it could be changed, but, you know, so often we think, oh, just lock people away for 20 years, 40 years, whatever. Life sentence, that'll, some people think it'll change them. It doesn't change them. You know, it doesn't change anybody no matter if they're free or in prison. The only way you're set free is in Jesus. When I have done jail ministry in the past, I said, and these that are born again in jail, now saved, it's like you're more free than most of the people in the world. Even though you're behind bars, you're free in Christ. You know where you're going when you die. Most people don't. So sad, though, um, that so many will choose to follow after Satan. Don't forget that, and you know, I've said it before, Satan's middle name is deception, and he will deceive so many in this world to follow after him. He'll probably use the same tactics as he does today. Oh, God could not love you, or I've got a better plan for your life, or, you know, you don't need God telling you what to do or how to live. You should be free to do your own thing. I mean, the same thing he says today. I'm sure he'll be saying similar things then. But again, he's very, very good at deception. And he won't ever change. Like Jesus said of Satan, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he does. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. So let's not have anything to do with Satan and his evil, deceptive ways today. You know, we need to walk in that abundant life, the spirit-filled life, according to the truth of God's word. That's where we find meaning and purpose to living, to this life. It's in Christ, not in just becoming like the world or being more compatible with the world. No, we find joy and peace in Jesus, and we're to change the world around us through the gospel. That's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Now, we may have everything to do with Jesus Christ and his abundant life, and yet Satan is still going to try to tempt you into listening to his lies. He's going to try to tempt you to follow after his ways. He's going to try to get you discouraged, get you frustrated, get you depressed, get you oppressed, which he can still do to a believer. He can't possess us, but he'll do everything he can to try to neutralize your relationship with God and try to neutralize your effectiveness to the world around you. And so that's why we need to come back and keep humbling ourselves before, before the Lord and walking in the power of the Spirit, being refreshed, refilled moment by moment, day by day. Now, notice here in verse 8, again, it mentions Gog and Magog. There's a little confusion here because the same two terms are used in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we know that war takes place before the millennial reign of Christ. That takes place probably right after the rapture. We can't be totally adamant about it. But in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we have these nations mentioned to us that come against Israel. And the nations... Uh, their present names today are Iran, Libya, Ethiopia, Syria, countries that make up the, the southern, former southern Soviet Union territories. But Russia will be the main one that leads this attack against Israel. And again, it seems to take place, I think, right after the rapture. Um, and God will destroy, according to the old King James, it says God destroys five-sixths of the Russian army. So that's a distinction. This battle involves people from all over the world, and we'll see that every one of them gets destroyed. So again, even though the names Gog and Magog are the same, they're two very different wars. I like to say it like this, just as we had World War I and World War II, this you could call Magog I and Magog II, two distinct battles that take place. Again, though, the unregenerate heart of mankind is wicked above all things, and a thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus on the earth is proof of this. For a thousand years, people cannot blame their environment for their sinful heart. This world will be the perfect environment in which to live. There will be no wars. There will be no political corruption. There'll be no immorality that will be tolerated. 
Therefore, there'll be no excuses. Again, Jesus himself will be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. For a thousand years, people won't be able to blame the devil. The devil made me do it. No, he didn't. He's locked away for a thousand years. But how sad that so many people who have lived on their earth, on this earth in their natural bodies, and have had Jesus Christ as their teacher and leader for a thousand years will turn against him. I mean, it's hard to fathom, but again, we saw the same thing with those who yelled out, crucify him, crucify him, 2,000 years ago. Their choice to follow Satan and rebel against Christ will end very, very quickly. So here's the, the verse. Um, I gave you my interpretation of it last week. This battle is just poof, it's done. Here it is, verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, reference to Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. In other words, God's judgment against the rebels is so quick, they won't even know what hit them. And the, the picture, you know, if you can, this scene here, well, Jesus, again, he's ruling in Jerusalem will be there. A lot of his followers are going to be there. Then all of, all of a sudden you got all these that will rebel against the Lord. They surround the holy city, and all it says is fire comes down from God out of heaven, and poof, that's it. They're devoured. That's all there is to it. It's not a massive, long, drawn-out battle. God says, you had your chance. This is it. You're done. So watch what happens to Satan here in verse 10, the one who leads this rebellion. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This will be Satan's last scene. This will be his eternal dwelling place, the lake of fire. And again, notice it says where the beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet are. They're still there at this time. They'll be there. They'll still be um, in torment because it says it's a place of eternal torment. Uh, it was at the second coming of Christ. A thousand years earlier, they were thrown into the lake of fire. And a thousand years later, Satan joins them and that they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The same phrase, phraseology is used that we have eternal life. We'll rule and reign with Christ forever and ever. It's not a temporary thing. Annihilation is not a biblical concept. With God, it's either eternal life that lasts forever and ever, or it's eternal damnation that lasts forever and ever. And I don't like the thought of eternal damnation. And I know a lot of Christians that are upset about that. Why would God? Well, you ask him when you see him. I don't know. He's perfect in all of his ways. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient, all-knowing. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And so what he says goes. His word tells us this. So I'm not going to argue with his word. I may not like it that people are going to suffer for eternity, but I do like the fact that if they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they're going to have eternal life with him. That means for eternity. And so the Bible is very clear. It teaches eternal separation. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So that should not make us mad. It should not make us upset. Really, that should motivate us to share the gospel with a lost and dying world around us. Uh, I look at this world like the Titanic. We've already hit the iceberg. It's going under. So what are you going to do? Try to put Band-Aids on the Titanic? Or are you going to try to rescue as many people from drowning as you can? 
That's the simple scenario we're looking at here. This world's like the Titanic. It is going down. The word of God is very clear, and we're going to see in a moment this entire planet's going to be vaporized. You're not going to save this planet. You can, you can spend trillions to try to change the climate, and it's not going to work. God will change the climate, as we've already seen and talked about. Now, it was the Apostle Paul's tremendous love for God and the Apostle Paul's tremendous love for the lost that led him to proclaim the gospel to those who are lost and dying in their sins. Wherever he went, whenever he would go somewhere, he would always share the gospel with them. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15, Paul says it like this, For the love of Christ compels us. That means the love of Christ is what motivates us. I mean, you read later on in chapter 12 or 11 of 2 Corinthians, and he's getting beaten, he's getting, you know, tortured, he's getting whipped, he's getting stoned and left for dead, he's going through shipwrecks. Why? He could have just said, you know what, I'm done. I'm a five-point Calvinist. God's going to save who he wants to save, and I'll go sit on the beach in the Mediterranean, you know, and just enjoy the rest of my life. No. Even though most five-point Calvinists quote Paul, what does Paul do? He's out there going through the tortures and the pain, the suffering. Why? Because it was the love of Christ that compelled him to motivate him to go and see people get saved by preaching the gospel to him. So he says, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. We're all dead in our sins apart from Christ. But he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So because of what he's done for us, we're not living for ourselves. We, we deny ourselves. We take up our cross daily. We follow Jesus. Since Jesus died for all people, that proves that God loves all people. And for those of us who are now alive in Christ, we should be compelled, motivated with that same love, to no longer live for ourselves, but for Jesus. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whatever vocation he's called you into, you're to be light and salt. Wherever you are. It's not just a, you know for the professionals, it's for all of us. Now, we need to look around us, and we need to, again, say, do I have enough love for Jesus that I want to share the good news with my friends? you know, family members, and I have, and most of them thought I was nuts, or with our friends. When I got saved in college at San Diego State, all my so-called friends said, we don't want anything to do with you anymore, and then I got a whole new set of friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to have love for our neighbors, our family members, those around the world. It's so important that we be light and salt. And the wonderful thing is whenever a person turns to Christ for salvation, Jesus radically saves them and changes them. As Paul says a few verses later there in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. And that is what Jesus can do for any lost sinner. He can change you into a new creation. You can go from being dead in your sins to be alive in Christ. You can be a saint in the Lord, a sanctified saint that he loves. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But that sanctification work means that what he started, Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. So he's still working on us. So don't look around at your brothers and sisters and size them up and judge them because we're all in process. You know, like Pastor Chuck used to say, you know, it's like God goes to the junkyard and he finds that beat up, mashed up 57 Chevy, brings it home. And, you know, it's like that guy that loves to work on old cars and then he gets them fixed up and then, you know, works on them. And then you come back a few years later. Wow, look at that thing. Almost done. I mean, that thing is shiny. It's starting to run. He's got all the new stuff in it. It's not ready to drive off the lot until the rapture, but... You know, it, God began a good work, and he will complete it. We belong to him. So now, as we come into verse 11, the scene here changes dramatically once again. The thousand-year reign of Christ is over, and God will totally and completely 
vaporize the entire universe. Think about that. Not just planet Earth, but the entire universe is going to be vaporized by the Lord. So try to picture this in your brain for a minute. For a moment in time, there will be nothing material. There will be no physical matter in the universe. I can't picture that, but that's what the Word tells us. But the Apostle John will now see one object in the universe that's visible, and it's the great white throne. Um, I try to picture that as it just kind of hanging out there in the darkness of space, this great white throne. Is it glowing white in the emptiness of the universe? I don't know, but this has got to be one of the most horrifying, ominous scenes that you will see anywhere in the Word of God. This scene here. Look at verse 11. John says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, this would be Jesus, from, whom's, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. So notice, the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And again, this verse speaks volumes here. Uh, first of all, it says the great white throne is a place um, where all unbelievers will come before. Um, as believers, we go before a different throne. We've talked about this in the past where we will stand before the Bema seat of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ. It's not for salvation because only saved people go before the Bema seat of Christ. It's a place of rewards. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5.10. He gives a whole scene of what happens there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll stand before the Lord and all of the things we've done in the flesh as Christians that were not done in the power of the Holy Spirit will be like hay, wood, and straw. Everything else we've done in the power of the Holy Spirit will be like gold, silver, precious stones. And at the end of that section, he says, you'll be rewarded for these things. But I've, as I've always said, whatever rewards we get, we cast our crowns at his feet because he alone is worthy. But only unbelievers will stand before this great white throne. <sighs> Praise the Lord that we are spared from this judgment. And it's only because our sins were put upon Jesus. And we receive Jesus and his forgiveness for our sins. So this is not a scene that we'll, we'll be here watching, but we're not going to be participating in the great white throne judgment. It's literally sentencing day for those who rejected the word of God. Now, again, I say it's Jesus seated upon the throne. The Bible is clear that all judgment has been given to Jesus. John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 Jesus says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And so that's kind of an indictment against the Jehovah's Witnesses that say, Oh, we believe in God, Jehovah, but we think Jesus is a created being. That's not honoring him? He's co-creator, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. You make Jesus anything less than God, then why would you worship him? Well, they say you don't worship him. That's idolatry. Exactly. But we see Jesus being worshipped throughout the Bible. and We will worship him when we see him face to face. We see people in the, in the book of Revelation worshiping the Lord. So be that as it may, all judgment has been given to Jesus. But notice also in verse 11, it says, and the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. This will speak, uh, you know, this refers to Jesus vaporizing everything. And the, and the word tells us that he will. Uh, Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Uh, the Apostle Peter gives us the greatest description of this uh, and what happens in the last days. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 10. Uh, this is the final scene that brings an end to what the Bible calls the day of the Lord. Um, again, the day of the Lord begins with the great tribulation. Right after the rapture of the church, it culminates 
after the millennial reign of Christ, but this is what Peter says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with, great, with a great noise, and he's referring to the material universe, and the elements that make up this material universe will melt with fervent heat. And the word melt means to loosen. Take note of that. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, that's the same word as melt or loosen, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, again the same word means to melt, loosen, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, the new heavens and the new earth, we'll see in a moment, is how Revelation 21 begins. But here we see how this old universe is vaporized. Again, he used that word three times. It means to uh, loosen, where it says it'll melt with fervent heat. It'll be dissolved. Um, so to loosen. So this is why I say this. Look at Colossians 1.17. This, this is the omnipotent power of Jesus Christ. It says, And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Again, the word consist means to hold together. As omnipotent God, all-powerful God, he is the one that holds all things together. From the little bitty atom to all the major, you know, all the solar systems out in the universe, all the galaxies, he's the one that holds everything in its place. You know, the positive charged protons should naturally fly apart, but they don't. Scientists don't know why. They call it cosmic glue. Well, Jesus is the cosmic glue, so to speak, that holds everything together. But a day is coming when he's going to release it, and it's going to be like one giant nuclear explosion throughout the universe. Even as God spoke everything to existence in Genesis 1, let there be light. Boom! There's light. He just spoke it into existence. The day is coming when he's going to loosen all things, and in a flash, it's all going to be gone, dissolved, nothing. The only thing that will stand at this moment will be this great white throne. How crazy is that? Um, this is why we will need to be in our resurrection bodies so that we can withstand all this, and we will. But unfortunately, now we read of another resurrection that is not unto eternal life. This one is unto eternal damnation. Look at verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Again, this is before the great white throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. So again, what an amazing awesome scene this is that John witnesses, and he watches as all the unbelievers throughout human history are raised up. He says, raised from the sea, so some believe this refers to Noah's flood. All those who were destroyed that rebelled against God during Noah's flood will be raised up to stand before the great white throne judgment. It says, and their graves, even Hades, Hades is the place where all the dead go, uh, presently, uh, in Jesus' day, Hades was divided into two sections, a place of torment and a place called paradise, or Abraham's bosom. Today you'll be with me in paradise, he tells the thief in the cross. But then Jesus led captivity captive. He emptied out the righteous side of Hades. So Hades, where all the rebel rebels have been, will be raised up as well. This is the fulfillment of what Jesus says in John 5, 28 and 29. He puts all these resurrections together, both of these, I should say. He says, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming, John 5, 28 and 29, 
For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good, in other words, they receive Jesus, to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, they've rejected God and his word, they've rejected Jesus, to the resurrection of condemnation. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. The unsaved are standing before Jesus as he is seated on the great white throne, and Jesus will judge them based on what is written in the books. Now, the question is, what books are, is he referring to here? Well, I know one of the books is the Bible. He'll judge them from the Bible, what the Bible says about Jesus. Jesus says in John chapter 12, starting in verse 48, He rejects me and does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say what I should say and what I should speak. And so the volume of God's word, which points to Jesus Christ, will clearly show every sinner the rejection of God's only means of salvation. Again, it's faith alone in Christ alone. There's no other way to get saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, you might not like that, but that's what God's word says. And so you can argue with God about his means of salvation, but he's very clear Jesus is the only way of salvation. At the end of Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, it says, The court was seated and the books were opened. And so whatever books here and records God has at his disposal, the only thing that really matters is, is your name in the Lamb's book of life? At the very moment Jesus Christ came into your life, he wrote your name into the Lamb's book of life. And at that very moment, all of my sins, all of your sins, all of your failures that were recorded in these books were simply erased by the blood of Jesus. Because my name was in a lot of bad books, <laughs> so to speak, and yet the blood of Christ cleanses us of all sin. He removes our names from those books and he writes our names in the Lamb's book of life. Now look at verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Uh, again, this is a horrible scene. When Jesus finishes, every single unredeemed person will be cast into the lake of fire. This is the final stop for all unrighteous sinners. Where is this going to be? It's not in the earth, the lake of fire. It'll be outside somewhere in the universe, but it's not in the earth like hell and Hades today. It'll be out there somewhere because they're cast in the lake of fire before there's a new heaven and a new earth created. But again, the last remnants of sin will be once and forever eliminated. And as you know, death comes from the result of sin and it will be gone forever and ever at this moment. Hades is the result of death. Sin brings death. Death leads to Hades. Death leads to eternal life with Jesus or eternal separation away from Jesus. And here we see even Hades is thrown into the lake of fire. Again, the lake of fire, fire is the place of eternal punishment for those who rejected Jesus Christ. This is the place where Jesus says the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. In Matthew 25, 46, Jesus says of the unrepentant sinners and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Everlasting, eternal. Same Greek word that means what? Everlasting, eternal. It's not temporary. Now notice how the lake of fire is called the second death. In other words, if a person rejects Jesus Christ their whole life, they will die physically, and without trusting Jesus, they will die again spiritually in the lake of fire. That's the second death. And there's an old saying, if you're born once, you'll die twice. 
You're born physically once. Without Jesus, you'll die physically, and then you'll die eternally in the lake of fire. If you're born twice, you'll only die once. In other words, you're born physically, but then you're born again by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. You'll only die once, physically. But even that will not separate us from, from God. Now, on the other hand, we need to realize the time is coming when Jesus will raise us up He'll bring us into his presence, and thus we will only die once, and unless, I believe, some of us may not die at all. This is what we read in 2 Corinthians 15, 51. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. What does that mean? We shall not all die. That's what the word sleep means. Paul talks about that in 1 Thessalonians 4. When he talks about sleep, it just means death. So we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. How fast? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Those of us who are alive remain at that moment. So being born again, that's what Jesus said was necessary for entrance into eternal life, salvation, into his realm of heaven. In John 3, 3, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, to Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you will not experience salvation. So praise the Lord for all of you that have put your faith and trust in Christ alone for your salvation because the day is coming when the trumpet sounds and we'll be snatched away quickly. We'll be in his presence for eternity and we will be in our resurrection bodies. It's going to be glorious. We'll be with Jesus. For those who reject the Lord, who have not been forgiven, they will experience the second death, he says, which is the lake of fire. Now, we're going to get to witness Genesis chapter 1 all over again. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to see Jesus, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're going to see them create a new heaven and a new earth out of nothing. Again, the whole universe is vaporized. When he talks about dissolving the heavens, he's not talking about God's dwelling place of heaven because that's perfect. When he talks about the heavens will be dissolved, there's three mentions of heaven. There's the heaven or the atmosphere around the earth. There's the uh, heavens where the universe is. And then there's the third heaven, as the Apostle Paul calls it. Remember when he was caught up into the third heaven, that was into the presence of God. That's perfect. That never gets changed. It's this atmosphere, this universe that's going to be dissolved. But look at chapter 21, verse 1. We'll just look at this one verse. We'll pick up here next time. But he says, now, so after, you know, everybody's thrown into the lake of fire that have rejected God. Then it says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. So all of you guys that wanted to surf, too bad. So again, he's speaking of a new heaven, a new universe is what he's going to create, a new earth. With sin eradicated forever, he's going to create something entirely new. Uh, you know, you see all the time, oh, a new and improved product. Well, this be be a new and improved universe. Um, I already quoted from 2 Peter 3 where we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This will be the fulfillment. Look at this verse, Isaiah 65, verse 17, where the Lord says, For behold, I create new heavens, again, the universe, the atmosphere around the earth, and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Now, the, the amazing thing here is, is the, the Hebrew word create. He says, I create a new heaven, new earth. The Hebrew word is bara, which means to create something out of nothing. Remember that. <laughs> you know, scientists today say, well, I can create, you know, life. Here, I'll take this dirt. Well, who created the dirt? 
First, you've got to create your own dirt and then see if you can bring, bring some life out of it. No, you can't. Only God can bring something out of nothing, and that's what exactly what he does here. He'll create out of nothing a whole new heavens and earth, a whole new universe. And he says, the former things shall be remembered no more. So just as God spoke everything into existence in Genesis 1, we get to watch him do it all over again. Again, Genesis 1:1 says, In the beginning was the word, or in the beginning was in the beginning, God created, same word, bara, the heavens and the earth. He created out of nothing. Only God can do that. So in closing, let me just say this. Because God is so good, He is so great, He is so awesome and powerful. We oftentimes lose the, the sight of the fact that he is so intimate and personal with us as individuals. I mean, I think, you know, God's hand spans the universe, you know. It's like, wow, I can't imagine, I can't picture that. And yet God's hands were nailed to the cross. That's how much he loves you. God's hands takes little children into his bosom. God's hands. How, he loves us so much. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy who says, God's too busy, he's too, you know, got other important things going on. Why bother God? No, the same Jesus who holds the entire universe together had those nails driven into his hands. The same God who is bigger than we could ever picture or imagine also was born as a baby in a manger 2,000 years ago. And he grew up perfect, but it was because he would die for our sins. Don't ever think he cannot relate to you because the Bible is very clear. In fact, we don't have it, but if you want to flip over to Ephesians 4, uh, 14, it tells us, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold our... Uh, hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So God is huge, but at the same time, only God can do something about whatever your situation in life is today. Whatever you're struggling with, He can help. Because He loves you and He cares for you. So don't ever lose sight of the fact that He is omnipotent God who came into this world, who loved you so much, He died in your place, taking upon Himself all the wrath and judgment that we've looked at in Revelation. He took it upon Himself so that we would never have to face his wrath and judgment. In this world, we'll have tribulation from the world and the flesh and the devil. But in the great tribulation, it's God's wrath and we're not destined for God's wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5.9, Romans 5.9, much more than having been justified through his blood, we shall be saved from wrath to come.